Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and visit some of their oldest crimes. Before we talk crimes, let's talk coloring. This week I have chosen a neat and tangled stamp set called Schoolhouse. I have a couple of school themed cards I'm trying to make, so I decided to stamp these images out. I have half of a sheet of Nina Classic Crest Solar White cardstock. Um, 80 pound and I'm going to place the images on my cardstock and pick them up with the misty lid. Um, I will go ahead and ink them up with a Copic friendly ink. I will be using Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink because it is Copic safe. Once I have stamped up the images, I will leave them in my misty and over stamp them when I'm done coloring so that I have a nice dark outline. That makes it easier for the scan and cut to pick up the images and trim them out as I do not have the dies for this stamp set. If you would like to see a video on how I use my scan and cut, leave me a comment below. I 100% will do that for you. Okay, our story today is a little bit long, so hopefully I have enough coloring footage to get it out there. And we are going to jump into our 11th alphabetical state, Hawaii. We are leaving the mainland and going to paradise. Kind of, sort of. Hawaii was granted statehood on August 21st, 1959. However, our story takes place in the 1930s when Hawaii was still a territory to the United States. There are a number of important characters in our story, so we're going to talk a little bit about our characters first. Grace is the first character. Grace Hubbard Bell was born on November 3rd, 1833 in Washington, D.C. and was the granddaughter of Gardner Hubbard, a wealthy financier who became the first president of Bell Telephone. Hubbard had backed Alexander Graham Bell, his son-in-law, for the commercial debut of Bell's invention, the telephone. Grace grew up playing in the sprawling grounds of Twin Oaks, the mansion her grandfather built in the upscale Rock Creek area of Washington, D.C. As a young debutante, Grace found her cultural background served her well, and in 1910, she married Major Granville, or Raleigh, Fortescue. Um, Granville was a rough rider and had served with Theodore Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War, where he had been wounded at San Juan Hill. The young couple embarked on a life of travel and privilege. However, her husband failed to be as financially successful as she had expected. Grace did all in her power to maintain a facade of success. She knew the value of appearances. Our next character is Thalia. Thalia Fortescue was born February 14, 1911 in Washington, D.C. to Grace and Granville Fortescue. Thalia is Grace's daughter. Named for the Greek muse of comedy, Thalia perhaps predictably grew up playing what she saw as harmless pranks. I don't think her victims thought they were harmless. However, her privileged social status always afforded her the freedom to get away with mischief. Thalia's um, family line assured her status in social circles in Washington, D.C. And it is was reported that Thalia really never quite grew up. She didn't embrace adulthood, often acting like a spoiled child. Thalia had not acquired the social graces of her mother, nor did she uh, acquire the confidence of her father. Um, there are reports that her personality appeared to be disjointed or fragmented. From her mother's social grace, Thalia learned that there was a class of people in the United States, and her father's confidence translated more into headstrong or stubborn, um, impetuous, impetuous behavior. Our next character is Thomas. Thomas, or Tommy Hedges Macy, was born to William and Aline Thomas Macy on March 5, 1905 in Winchester, Kentucky. Thomas graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 1927. Tommy had not been a shining academic star at Annapolis, but relied heavily on his athletic abilities to stand out. As a commissioned officer, he knew he had to make up for his weak academic record with sterling social skills. And a young, beautiful wife to attend social engagements and entertain guests would certainly be an asset. 
Um, just after his Thanksgiving Day wedding, Tommy received his first assignment. He was to serve as an ensign aboard the aircraft carrier Lexington, a job that placed his new bride back in her parents' care. So Thalia and Tommy were married on Thanksgiving Day, and then Thalia went back to live with her parents while Tommy took on his first tour of sea duty. On June 2nd, 1930, Tommy was pr promoted to junior lieutenant, and by the end of that month, he and Thalia were in Hawaii, where Tommy reported for duty on a submarine stationed in Pearl Harbor. Our next character is a man named Joseph, and I'm going to butcher his last name, and I apologize. Oh my goodness, I looked up how to say this, and I think I have it right. Kahawaii. Kahawaii. Joseph Kahawaii. We're just going to call him Joe was born to Joseph Sr. and Esther Anatino in rural Maui on December 25th, 1909, Christmas Day. His family moved to Honolulu, and then his parents divorced. Joe lived with his mother, who later remarried, but Joe remained in contact with his father. He attended elementary school in Kaha'awai and attended the St. Louis School through an academic scholarship to play high school football. And he built up a pretty positive reputation. Due to the great reputation, Joe never graduated and worked various jobs. He also enlisted in the ter territorial, sorry, words are hard, territorial National Guard as a boxer. Joe fought both professionally under the name Joe Kalani and as a member of the 298th Infantry Regiment. Okay, so now on to the crime part of our story. Tommy and Thalia's marriage wasn't exactly happy. Thalia was only 16 when they were married, which is not out of the ordinary for the time, but the reports that she acted like a spoiled child as opposed to an adult, um, this is probably why. Okay, Thalia also had a reputation for being snobby and rash. She did not win friends in Hawaii's Naval Society. Um, while the majority of the Navy wives attended flower arranging and hula classes, Thalia enrolled in classes at the University of Hawaii to continue her education, which had ended abruptly when she married. The romantic view that Thalia had of becoming a Navy wife, a life that promised adventure and travel, wore off quickly. And despite living in an exotic locale, Thalia found the numerous social engagements and polite conversations bored her just as easily as had gatherings on the East Coast. Used to doing whatever she pleased, Thalia often left parties abruptly, giving other guests the impression that she thought herself socially and intellectually superior. Her attitude began to take a toll on her marriage because socializing and entertaining were required to further a Navy career. When Thalia's actions began um, to cause gossip among the other Navy wives during their card games and other activities, Tommy threatened to send his wife back to her parents if she failed to improve her behavior. There were also reports of violence in their marriage. Tommy and Thalia had rented a cottage in Mo Mo Moana Valley, I hope, where a lot of the Naval colleagues lived with their wives. Thalia and Tommy fought loudly and often, and neighbors on their street complained of bitter screaming matches. Friends in the Navy reported that Thalia had even bitten Tommy during an argument. And if that's not enough, unhappiness and violence was not the only issue. In the summer of 1931, um, Thalia was pregnant and diagnosed with preeclampsia and lost her baby. And after the miscarriage of her child, she sought counseling from a psychologist. And the psychologist concluded that Thalia's personal and emotional problems were so serious that they required treatment by a psychiatrist. Okay, so what, is, what does Thalia and Tommy have to do with Boxing Joe and, and Thalia's mom, Grace? I'm about to tell you. On, September, on a September night in 1931, Horace Ida, a young Japanese man, that's important, borrowed his sister's um, two-year-old car and attended a luau, and he had friends with him. He had his friend Joe, his friend Benny, his friend Dave, and his friend Harry. At about 12.30 a.m., 
Horace suggested they call it a night. He and his friends piled into the car and left the luau. As the car passed through an intersection in downtown Honolulu, Horace barely missed colliding with an automobile coming from the opposite direction. There was no contact between the cars, but both drivers stopped and everyone piled out to argue. The occupants of the other car were Agnes and Horace Peoples. Mrs. Peoples was voicing her opinion of Horace Ida's driving skills when Big Joe, as he was known, all six feet or more of him, hauled off and punched her in the face. Mrs. Peoples was equal to the challenge. She gave as good as she got. She clenched her fists, wound up, and to Big Joe's surprise, slugged him in the mouth. Both parties were commenting on the other's race and their ability to drive based on their ethnicity. That word I can't say. After Joe and Mrs. Peoples punched each other in the faces, <laughs> cooler heads prevailed and the Peoples drove off to the police station to report the incident. At the station, the Peoples gave Horace Ida's license plate number as 58-895 and the police put out an all points bulletin for the car and its occupants. At the same time, the police were getting reports of an assault and rape on the island. So the same night that Horace and his companions had a run in with the Peoples, Tommy and Thalia, and along with the Browns and the Bransons, other naval couples, attended a Navy event at a Waikiki nightclub. Sometime around 1130, Thalia had an argument with Tommy, and after slapping him across the face, she was seen storming out. Um, Thomas assumed she was angry, and he stayed at the nightclub and was just going to continue his socialization or socializing. Um, Thalia left the nightclub and she claimed that she was um, walking towards Waikiki Park, another nightclub or dance hall that was a little bit down the road from the, the nightclub where the Navy event was taking place. The second club, Waikiki Park, had a dance that night as well, and that dance was normally scheduled to end at 11.45, but it is reported that that event stayed going on. It actually ended closer to 11.55 that night, which is right around the time that Thalia and her husband would have gotten into an argument, okay? The last dance at the naval event was supposed to stop at midnight. However, the participants did not let the orchestra stop playing until one o'clock in the morning. Um, when the orchestra stopped about one o'clock in the morning, Tommy looked around for his wife. And when he couldn't find her, he assumed that she had gone home and went and found um, his friends and headed to the home of another naval officer. Apparently, there was to be an after party at this officer's home. So um, Branson's wife took his car or took their car and went home. And Tommy and Lieutenant Branson piled into Tommy's car and headed over to this after party. However, when they got to this friend's home, there was no party actually there. And Lieutenant Branson fell asleep on the, at the house where Tommy went looking for snacks. While Tommy was foraging for food, he tried to call his wife to make sure she had arrived home safely. Um, after several calls, she did answer her phone and told him he needed to come home immediately. Um, something terrible had happened. So Tommy took his car, leaving his sleeping friend, Lieutenant Branson, there at the non-party party. So backing up just a little bit, Sometime between 12.20 and 12.45 Sunday morning, Thalia was picked up as she walked down an isolated and unlit portion of a road by a car with two couples in it, the Bellingers and the Clarks. When the car stopped, Thalia asked if the people in the car were white. She reportedly asked this because she had very poor eyesight. <clears throat> Excuse me. She had been beaten and had suffered a broken jaw after being abducted, leaving a party at the, or leaving the naval party. 
Okay. She had a bruise on her face. And when the couples in the car asked what happened, she said that four or five dark skinned Hawaiians had forced her into a car and beaten her. When the shocked couples asked if anything else had happened, Thalia said no. And she claimed that since it was dark, she had been unable to see the license plate number of the car. And although Thalia was told she could go to the or Ophelia was told she should go to the police or the very least the hospital, but she refused and just asked them to take her home. So fast forwarding to somewhere around two o'clock in the morning, Tommy arrived home and Thalia told him about the assault. Over her objections, he immediately phoned the police who arrived to take her statement. And initially she couldn't provide any details at all. She said, again, she did not know the license number of the car and she could not visually recognize the perpetrators, but could recognize their voices. She said she could tell from their voices that they were Hawaiian and that one was called Bull, B-U-L-L. Um, although the police officers repeatedly asked Thalia about the license number of the car, Thalia repeatedly and clearly stated she could not identify the license plate number. However, Thalia changed her story several hours later at the hospital. Um, while she was at the hospital, she claimed to police that she had been kidnapped while walking on John Ina Road and after being beaten in the car, she had been gang raped. And now she had a license plate number. So within hours, police, the police had arrested a Japanese American man named Horace Ida. Now, keep in mind that Thalia said that Hawaiians attacked her. She knew they were Hawaiians because of how they sounded. Um, Ida was not entirely surprised at first, as only a few hours earlier, he had been involved in a near collision while driving in his sister's car with several friends, including Big Joe. Upon his arrival at the police station, the charges with the altercation were never brought up. Instead, he found to his dismay that he was being charged with rape. Later that day, Joe and the other men were um, brought to, brought by the police to the Macy's house for Thalia to, to try to identify them. And one of the men was actually brought to the hospital. They apparently arrested him first for a positive identification. The police also brought the car to the Macy's house. And she said she could not positively identify it as her attacker's car at the time. And then later testified that the car was just like the car she had seen the night before. So she's um, kind of all over the page, which is not, you know, completely unexpected if she's had a trauma, maybe, you know, and maybe she had a few drinks at the party, who knows? She's going to be a little iffy, right? So at first glance, the story seems to be credible. Thalia's um, description to the police didn't change much. You know, she, she um, repeatedly said she didn't know the license plate number, except that after she got to the hospital. At about 2.30 in the morning on the 13th of September, Thalia was examined by, doc by a doctor at the hospital. The medical examination determined that they could not confirm nor deny that a rape had occurred, but Thalia did have a broken jaw, which did require surgery several days later. Meanwhile, she continued to reiterate to the doctor and nurse that she could not recognize her attackers. After being examined at the hospital, Macy was once more, or Thalia, sorry, there's two Macy's, Thalia was once more interviewed by the police, and this time by John McIntosh. He was the inspector of detectives at the station. And this time, Macy was able to recall a license plate number claiming, I think it was 58-805. I would not swear to that being correct. I just caught a fleeting glimpse of it as they drove away. So not only was Thalia suddenly able to come up with an entire license plate number, but this license plate number differed from the car that the Peoples had the accident with by one digit. It was also during this interview that, that Thalia said the name Joe came up during the assault in addition to the name Bull. 
The two largest newspapers in Hawaii quickly described the young men as fiends, thugs, and gangsters. And while Thalia wasn't initially identified by name, the papers wrote how the assault had occurred to a refined and cultured young lady of highest character. And although Thalia described her accusers as Hawaiian, the five young men came from various ethnic backgrounds. Two were Native Hawaiians, two were Japanese, and one was a Chinese Hawaiian. However, the men cast as Hawaiians not only by their accuser, but the white population at large. Many of the papers, in addition to printing the boys' photos and addresses, also underlined prior charges that a couple of the boys had faced. Two of the men and several other boys, not including the five in this case, had um, faced the charge of gang rape before. But during the trial, the girl who made the accusation admitted that it wasn't rape, that she was involved in a sexual relationship and only claimed rape when her mother and aunt had sex shamed her about that um, relationship. On November 16, 1931, the trial against these five young men began. However, the prosecution's case had a glaring weakness that became apparent throughout the trial. There wasn't much time in which this rape could have occurred. According to famous trials, Thalia was last seen with a white man on John Inner Road around midnight, September 13th, and couldn't and wouldn't be picked up by the Bellingers and the Clarks until 12.50, so that's nearly an hour. Meanwhile, the five boys, or the five young men, were seen by other witnesses at the Luau on Baratina Street between 12.15 and 12.20, which was a distance from the alleged rape site. And at 12.35, they were involved in this near collision with the peoples. So considering the fact that the altercation with the peoples happened roughly a 10-minute drive away from the site of the alleged gang rape, there would have been little to no time for a gang rape to have been committed by Joe and the other boys or other men. As the case developed cracks, um, Thalia's story immediately appeared to be questionable. In order to have assaulted Thalia, an event so far unproven to have even occurred, it would have been extremely difficult for them to have been involved in a near accident across town. The police themselves were split on the case. Many of the detectives were locals who saw the case was a sham, and when they were denied access, access to the courtroom, started to talk directly to the press. Rumors then began to develop and spread throughout the city. There were those who whispered that Thalia had not been raped at all. It was said that she was having an illicit relationship with one of the five suspects and that she was on her way to a rendezvous, rendezvous with him when she found him in the company of four drunken friends, which isn't any more likely to happen than a gang rape given the time lapse and the distance. It was also speculated that Thalia was having an affair with one of Tommy's shipmates, and when Tommy came home after the party, so the gossip went, he found his wife and his friend in a compromising position, and it was actually Tommy who beat up his wife and broke her jaw. Now, Thalia's mother, Grace Fortescue, um, was enraged by the stories and what she saw as an attempt to sully the name of her daughter and the family and quickly started a public campaign to attack the defendants. However, the case fell apart in court, and after a three-week trial and a lengthy jury deliberation, the jurors declared themselves deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. Now, Grace Fortescue was not willing to wait for another trial. She first arranged for the kidnapping and vicious beating of Horace Ida, the owner or the, the brother of the owner of the car. Next, she talked Tommy into getting two friends in the Navy to help him, a man named Albert Jones and Edward Lord, and they kidnapped Joe. Now, because the, the five defendants in this case had not been um, found innocent, they were on parole, and Joe was required by the court to meet with his probation officer every morning in downtown Honolulu. So Grace and Tommy knew exactly where to find him. Joe was likely targeted because he was the darkest colored of the rape suspects. Yeah, that's just mean and nasty, and I don't even know. On January 7th, 1932, 
Jones, one of the naval friends of Tommy, grabbed Joe as he was leaving the judiciary building after waving a fake military summons in his face. The four ordered him into a car at gunpoint. After taking Joe to Grace's, wherever Grace was staying, her rental house or whatever, the um, Honolulu newspaper reported that Joe was shot in the chest after refusing to confess. Debating what to do, they eventually decided to dump Joe's body off Cocoa Head, which at the time was pretty desolate and far away from urban Honolulu. And although he would eventually be found, it seemed to them unlikely that anybody would care. They wrapped Joe in a sheet and put him in Grace's rented car, pulling down the shades to hide the interior. A police motorcyclist alerted to the kidnapping, saw the blinds, and considered it suspicious. That's like in today's world, having an overly tinted car, I guess. Anyway, he pulled them over and immediately arrested Grace, Tommy, and his friends for murder. This time, the story could no longer be kept under wraps, and the mainland press soon started printing the stories as well. Clarence Darrow decided to take on the group's defense for the sum of $30,000. Now, Throughout the trial, Thalia Thalia presented herself as an innocent victim. She was the victim of an attack. She was the victim of rape. And she was not involved in this supposed um, kidnapping, right? I'm using air quotes here like you can see me. The prosecutor, John Kelly, played on her feelings of superiority. Um, While she was on the stand, she became enraged ripped up a piece of evidence, and stormed from the stand. And this seemed to be a prosecution victory. However, the courtroom erupted in supportive applause from the spectators, like she had done something awesome. The jury returned a verdict of manslaughter rather than murder. Grace and Tommy and his two Navy friends committed premeditated murder, and the jury convicted them of manslaughter. Racial tensions were so high that everyone expected, they really had expected another hung jury. Um, The mainland press exploded with even more stories, and the situation in Hawaii grew tense. Um, Admiral Sterling was considering enacting martial law, and he had been kind of watching the tensions from the beginning and had been considered imposing on it from the very beginning of this trial. After a flurry of diplomatic maneuvering between Washington, D.C. and Honolulu, Um, Martial law was avoided, and instead, under pressure from the Navy, the territorial governor, whose name was Lawrence Judd, commuted the 10-year sentences of the convicted killers to, get ready to grind your teeth, one hour to be served in his office. So these four people who committed premeditated murder because they were rich and well-connected got a 10-year sentence commuted to one hour in the governor's office. Days later, the entire group, including Tommy, Thalia, Grace, and the two Navy men, um, and their attorney, Darrow, boarded a ship and left the island in turmoil. Um, Thalia and Tommy actually divorced in 1934, just a couple of years later. And unfortunately, she committed suicide in 1963. Um, Tommy died in 1987. Grace died in 1979 and was buried in Arlington with her deceased husband. Albert Jones, one of the Navy friends that helped died on September 23rd, 1966, and Edward Lord died in 1967. In 1966, while being interviewed, Albert Jones admitted that he was the one who shot Big Joe. And that's not even the whole story. Even though the prosecution's lead witnesses, Thalia and Tommy, had left the island and could not be forced to return to testify, The four surviving defendants could not be exonerated, nor could they be convicted. Congress, the Navy, and the mainland public opinion would not allow the charges to be dropped without good reason. Before the subsequent dismissal of charges, Governor Judd hired the famous Pinkerton's National Detective Agency to further investigate and to review the evidence. 
the Pinkerton Agency responded with a 279-page report in which the introductory letter stated, and I'm going to read it and hopefully it makes sense. An analysis of the reports of our representatives together with the reports and statements of the Attorney General's Office, the Office of the Public Prosecutor, and the Police Department, also the testimony at the trial of the defendants, makes it impossible to escape the conviction that the kidnapping and assault was not caused by those accused, with the attendant circumstances alleged by Mrs. Macy. Okay, they don't think that it happened. There was some belief that Thalia Macy may have heard the license plate number while the police officers were driving her from her house to the hospital to be examined. Ultimately, the Pinkerton report showed that Thalia Macy was exposed to the license plate number numerous times before she, quote, remembered the information. Okay. I was a little bit annoyed when I saw this story, but it's a fascinating story in and of its own self. And while it technically occurred before Hawaii was a state, I think it still counts because Hawaii was a territory at the time. Um, let me know your opinions of this story. I kind of feel like sometimes the rich think they can get away with all the things. I did find some photos. This is Grace Fortescue, um, Thalia's mother. The next photo is a photo of Thalia herself, and she looks young in this picture. I mean, she was young when she got married, but she looks really young. I did find a picture of her husband, Tommy, in his naval uniform. He also looks kind of young, although not quite as young as her. And I did find the, the mug shots or pictures of the five defendants that were published in the newspaper in Hawaii. Those poor boys. Oh my goodness. They look almost as young as Thalia uh, did in that picture. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Crime and Coloring. I have chosen a couple other videos here I think you would like, and I've added a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and have a really great day.